the Apatanis had a very sophisticated economy, but they lacked a number of features of um, more developed economies. What features did they lack? Well, they didn't have the principle of animal traction, for instance. Uh, although they have cattle, the cattle was neither used for plowing nor for carrying. So their economy was really a very sort of, in a way, Neolithic, so they were not Stone Age because they had met metal. Did they use wheels? Did they, they did wheels? not use wheels. I think the first wheel they saw was the first, on the first Indian aeroplane when the Indian army made an uh, airstrip there. They had no wheels. You, you worked among the Apatanis, um, but quite soon after you, you visited there with uh, your wife. Another uh, white lady visited them, namely Ursula Graham Barr. Did you meet I had her? met her before, but actually her husband was then appointed there as political officer. That was not immediately after I had finished there. There was a kind of period in between when the Apatanis again were left to their own devices. Then, un already after independence, uh, the Indians uh, established there a, a much more complicated administration. Now, Ursula Grambauer, who had worked independently in the Naga Hills. She then came to the Apatanis and also then wrote a book on them called The Hidden Land. Uh, and her husband was a political officer. So a certain amount of anthropological material is also was provided by her. The people you worked among the Apatanis and also among the Nagas, were they physically an attractive people? The Nagas were very attractive, particularly the Cognac Nagas. They were really quite beautiful people, also these wonderful figures. Girls were very attractive. They are Mongolian, but rather sort of like Malays or Indonesians. And very, very good looking, really. The Apatanis were also Mongolian. They were perhaps not quite as attractive as, as Cognac now. But still, I would say, on the whole, they were attractive people. They looked attractive. And what about the place itself, the physical landscape? The Naga Hills are absolutely beautiful, the landscape. They are not very high. I mean, the villages are lying at altitudes between 3,000 and 6,000 feet, and sort of beautiful rolling hills, and with that pattern of shifting cultivation. I mean, forests here and there, golden rice fields, very, very attractive. The Apatani Valley, as such, is also a beautiful place. Uh, it's set in between wooded hills. The valley bottom is about nearly 5,000 feet high. The hills left and right are about six, 7,000. And uh, the, apart from the area which is under rice and which accordingly is sometimes pale green and sometimes also golden and so on. They have quite a lot of orchards and in the spring it is absolutely beautiful when all these fruit trees are in blossom. So the whole area is extremely attractive. On clear days you see the Himalayan peaks at the back. Well, later we'd like to return to the question of how the Apatani economy changed. But I wondered if we could now turn from 
Assam and the Northeast Frontier Agency to the other area where you did a lot of work, uh, chronologically going backwards. You first went to work in uh, Hyderabad among some very simple people, hunter-gatherer peoples, called the Chenchus. What made you study them and what were they like? Well, the whole position in Hyderabad was, I mentioned before, that I was sort of caught there by the outbreak of the war and allowed by the Hyderabad government, Hyderabad was then under the Nizam of Hyderabad, to work among the tribal populations. And it was a fairly obvious choice. There was one tribe not well known, not well described, known as Chenchus. They were one of the few types of hunters and food gatherers left still in Peninsular India. So it was reasonable to start among them. It was a great contrast to the highly advanced Nagas with their huge villages and very beautiful people. Chenchus are rather, one would say, rather unattractive and very uh, dark-skinned and have nothing of all the beautiful clothes, for instance, which the Nagas have. So it was a disappointment for, for my wife. She had always seen these lovely photographs of the Nagas, and it was her first time that she <laughs> went uh, accompany me on field work. And there there were these very poor Chenchus who lived in under windscreens or uh, little huts and had really very uh, not much which was visibly attractive. But they were very interesting because they were, very, were one of the few tribes who still lived on collecting, food collecting, digging up roots in the forest and some forest fruits, etc. Hunting, there wasn't much hunting left because uh, their territory is quite small and people had come from outside with guns, etc. They had more or less wiped out all bigger game. So they just managed to survive as they were. But their type of, of the lifestyle was still probably as in India, hunters and food gatherers were over centuries, if not thousands of years. I mean, we know that in South India there were uh, <coughs> Paleolithic uh, cultures and those makers of these Paleolithic uh, scrapers and hand axes and so on, they must have lived on the same kind of uh, forest produce as the trenches did. So from that point of view it was interesting. You, um, what was most striking about the Chenchus? Is there anything that you found most extraordinary about their way of life? Well, uh, I think probably again that was the striking thing was they too, as I mentioned before, some people in Northeast India that they had no kind of judicial system, no authority system, but they seemed to manage to live peacefully without conflicts and uh, <coughs> but largely because I think the communities were so small, the areas of conflict were so few because nobody had any property and everybody went out in the morning and collected roots and fruits from the forest. So there was not much uh, reason for any kind of conflict. Apart from that, if two people in a group didn't get on, then one probably moved to another group because nobody had any uh, property in land. So there was a great mobility. I mean, you, uh, if you saw a settlement, let's say, of eight or nine huts at one time, and you came perhaps 
two months later there, you found that uh, three or four families may have moved from there, settled somewhere else, because they were never settled for very long in one place. So that was interesting, this great flexibility. Moving from that very uh, simplest of social organizations, they're very complex as well, to your next piece of field work in Hyderabad. You worked among the Reddies of the Bison Hills. What sort of society was that and why did you study them? Uh, well, I went there again because nobody had studied them. The whole area which was uh, in the Eastern Guards, about where the Godavari break, Godavari River breaks through the Eastern Guards, there are some forested hills, and in these uh, people lived who were shifting cultivators. Rather, I mean, the Cognac Nagas were shifting cultivators too, but much more advanced with large settlements, etc. The Reddit lived in small settlements, again, great mobility, they lived for two or three years in one place and then they shifted their fields and very often also their huts. So um, they were really in a way the next stage after the changes. and the changes were only food gatherers and hunters. The Redis were also still lived a good deal on what they gathered in the forest but in addition to that. They also had slash and burn cultivation and grew millets and pulses and uh, not rice because it's too dry there and they had no wet fields. But uh, perhaps they lived on their, the grain which they reaped could live for about five, six months, the rest of the time they had to look for food in the forest. So they were on the, really in a stage of transition between uh, f food gatherings and cultivation. Also they had already begun to uh, have some income from forest labor. They were used by forest contractors to cut bamboos. In that way, they were very often rather badly cheated because they didn't know really what was the, how many bamboos they had cut. And they were only paid after some, uh, perhaps after some weeks, and they were told, well, you delivered so and so many hundred bamboos, and it was kind of piecework. And, so they were not very well treated by, by the outside world, but somehow they subsisted on a bit of weight labor, a bit of trash and burn cultivation, and still some uh, hunting and gathering in the forest. What sort of uh, settlements did they live in? Were they scattered like Well, they lived partly in f settlements in the forest where there were perhaps four, five, six houses in a forest clearing. Some had moved, that was in the hills, some had moved down to the, near the banks of the river. And there they had, uh, there were villages of perhaps 15, 20, 25 houses, and there they had begun some permanent cultivation. There was some flat land, and they had begun there to use plows and cultivate sorghum and other crops. Uh, the tragic uh, point in that was they had been sort of advanced to permanent cultivation, but in more recent years, then, they nearly lost all that permanent land because outsiders from mainly the coastal areas came in, uh, non-tribals, Telugu-speaking people, and so they already lost most of that land again. We then, uh, we then moved on, having done enough field work for most anthropologists for their lifetime, but you then went on to work among an even more economically uh, settled population, the Gons, but they were still uh, slash and burn 
No, the Gaunts were already proper plough cultivators. There are different types of Gaunts. Some, but those I mainly worked in, which were also in Hyderabad state, in a district known as Adilabad district, uh, they also lived in uh, forest areas, but they all had permanent land and cultivated with ploughs and bullocks and were much more settled than the uh, Redis. Of course, the Gaunts have an old history. There were Gaunt Rajas and even in the Middle Ages, Gaunt States, and they were really in many ways uh, on a level with Hindu population, perhaps economically. So uh, it was quite a, a different scenario. And also the Gorns were very numerous. There were, alone in Hyderabad, there were nearly a hundred thousand Gorns. Altogether in India, there are nearly four million Gorns. And they are divided into different tribes. For instance, Gorns were also studied by Varya Elvin. I mentioned before his book on the youth dormitories, the Murya Gons in Basta, which is adjoining to Hyderabad. But uh, each of these tribes has its peculiar system, and these so called Raj Gons I studied, they were uh, very different from the, from the Basta Gons, and in a sense, economically more advanced. But they were then also under threat, namely their land was quite attractive with rich soil, particularly suitable for growing cotton, black cotton soil. And so there had already begun a process by which Gorn land was alienated by more advanced people who came from the plains. Uh, the Gorns in the highlands of Adilabad, were in the hills, I mean not mountains, but sort of on plateaus and uh, areas a bit different from the big river uh, valleys like the Godavari Valley. And people from there then were infiltrating into the highlands and the process had begun where the Gorns, some of the Gorns, lost their land. You describe in your book on the Gorns, because this was a society you worked in perhaps almost longer than all, any other society, nearly three years in their villages you spent. Um, you describe a sort of contradiction between a society which has a, a very free association of equal peoples uh, combined with a sort of feudal system. I wondered how what, how this society worked? Well, the feudal system was a kind of remnant from the days of the great Gond Rajas. There was a kind of hereditary aristocracy. But at the time when I came to that area, they really had held no more political power because that was taken over by the administration of the Nizam's government. But the uh, descendants of the former Rajas, they had still uh, some status and not material privileges, but they were still highly respected. They, uh, in the sense that they are probably word counted more than that of other people if there were. Uh, drawn out disputes and very often they were preferred then fine people went to one of the Gond Rajas and asked him to <coughs> meditate. Uh, but uh, basically it was an egalitarian society so that we find that the in the villages there uh, were no really no uh, status difference except for these few members of Gond Rajas. Was this uh, 
Was this a beautiful area that you were working in? I mean, physically? Not as beautiful as the, as the Naga Hills, but quite attractive. I mean, at that time there was still a lot of forest, so the villages were enclaves in uh, the forests, and it was, I would say, it was an attractive area without being having beautiful scenery. And what are the people? Are you saying the Gorns? The Gorns are, I can't say that they are very handsome, but they are quite attractive people. They are not spectacularly dressed or undressed like the Nagas. They were more or less like Indian villagers in dhotis and saris. But I, they are very pleasant people and I was quite, quite enjoy my stay there. But they, at that time there were already endless problems over questions of land and exploitation. After you, um, your purely anthropological res research among the Chinchus, Gons and Redis, I understand that you were employed by the Hyderabad government in an administrative capacity. I wondered if you could say what you did in that work. Well, the Hyderabad government, his arms government at that time, Hyderabad, as you know, was the uh, largest of the uh, Indian princely states, uh, had begun was aware by that time that there were problems in the tribal areas. And as I had worked among the tribes by that time for about four years and also had, had been employed by government of India on the northeast frontier, they decided to offer me a position as advisor of for tribes and backward classes, as the position was co called. But actually, it was an administrative position where I had not only to advise, but I was then head of a department, kind of tribal welfare department, now it is called like that, and dealing with all the problems which are faced by the tribes. And the main main problem was to secure them in the possession of their land. So I started among the Gorns with a sort of large scheme of land reform that the Gorns were actually in possession, in occupation of land, but many, only few of them had any permanent rights. So the first step was to provide them all with rights to the land they had and those who had, were not in occupation of land to give them land. And at that time, the idea was to provide every family with anything between 15 and 20 acres, which is quite adequate of dry land. That was, so to say, the essential foundation for any kind of improvement in their economic position. Because the idea was that from then on, nobody could acquire tribal land. Legislation was passed. Large areas, the major part of the districts inhabited by tribals were sort of uh, made scheduled areas, as it's called in India, uh, where only tribals could acquire land and no outsiders. And I held that position for four years. And at the end of this period, uh, it seemed that the tribal problem from that point of view had really been solved. Of course, it wasn't known at that time that Hyderabad state would be um, incorporated into India, that the Nizam's administration uh, 
would come to an end and that <coughs> quite a different kind of government would come in. Government which was not so interested in the affairs of the, the welfare of the tribals. And uh, when I now go back to Hyderabad, which I do quite often, I find that much of the land which in my days was given to tribals has again been alienated by an extraordinary influx of non-tribals from the neighboring areas, partly even from outside the state, from Maharashtra, there's a great immigration. But that is part of that mobility in India, which also has recently, for instance, created all the trouble in Assam, where so many people from Bangladesh and Bengal entered Assam. And in Hyderabad too, Hyderabad of course is now only the town, is called Hyderabad, the area is called Andhra Pradesh. Uh, there the tribals have suffered very badly from the influx of non-tribals, much more advanced, uh, much more experience in dealing with the administration, so that actually uh, the situation, the economic and political situation of the tribals is not particularly good now. But at the time of the Nizam's rule, uh, I was able not only to carry out that system of land reform, but also to start schools for tribals, and schools in which they were at first talked in their own language. Gondi is a Dravidian language, but it is quite different from Telugu and other areas. Dravidian languages, so the idea was to have schools in which the children at first would be taught in their own language. There were of course no books, so the books had to be special readers and primers had to be uh, composed and printed. So that was again an attempt to kind of secure the Gond culture which is quite a complex, I mean, Golds have a large fund of myths and legends, etc., but they had no uh, script and they had no literature. So that was an attempt to create a kind of Gold literature. Uh, unfortunately, again, the changed political situation has really more or less wiped out those advances. Now there are no more Gondi school books used, but the tribals have to have the same kind of education anybody else has. So this again was an attempt made which didn't lead to very much. It would have led if the, there had not been very great political changes, but the anthropologists can't know that. But I think to go to that, I think inherently, I think it is a very important function of anthropologists who have spent perhaps three or four years to learn about a group of tribal people, that then they should become uh, able, I mean, to put into a position where they can do something concrete for the tribal. Of course, nowadays it's not very likely that many Western anthropologists can do. I mean, Indians could do that. Uh, because with the end of the colonial period, there are not many, many parts of the world where anthropologists actually are entrusted with uh, the administration of tribal people. Could I ask, on the administrative side, I know that you admire greatly the uh, philosophical and theoretical system put forward by a man who combined anthropology and administration, Beria Elwin. You knew Elwin and you seem to have worked in many of the same societies as Elwin. Could you say something about him? Well, Elwin was a very wonderful person. He was, uh, he came to India as a missionary. Then he found out that what he taught, and worked first among Gorns of the central provinces, which is now Madhya Pradesh. And he found that Gons really don't need a new religion. They, what they want is help in practical matters. And he really did, 
set up some sort of welfare centers first, entirely privately with some funds which he collected. And later on, however, he was employed by the government of India, again as advisor in uh, the Northeast Frontier Agency. In between, however, he had done a lot of anthropological work in areas such as Basta and written books like the Muria and Der Gotul and Maria Murder and Suicide, etc. He was perhaps the greatest sort of anthropological idealist I had ever met. He had, was a very well educated person uh, with a very sort of wide and broad outlook on life and and he was absolutely fascinated by tribal people and he collected for instance a great deal of their myths and epics etc. He also married twice tribal girls, one gaunt girl and one other later on. And then finally he lived in his last years, he lived in Assam in Shillong. He died re relatively early, but not uh, before he had really made a very great contribution, not only to anthropological literature, also in a sort of inspiring people. For instance, he was quite in had close contact with the Prime Minister Nehru, Pandit Nehru. And uh, I think much of the what had been done in the Northeast frontier is due to the influence of uh, Vary Elwin, who said that we must protect tribal people. We must not uh, think that they must be totally assimilated to the culture of the advanced sections of the population. So he had. Uh, I think he, he exerted a very healthy influence on the thinking of that generation of Indians, like Nehru. Again, much of that has disappeared, but not completely, because in the in the northeast frontier, which is now called, was, was called uh, NIFA, North East Frontier Agency, now called Arunachal Pradesh, in that territory really the situation of the tribals is far better than anywhere else. Because there is the so-called inner line policy, namely a policy that there is a line drawn between the tribal areas and the other parts of the country, in this case between Assam and Arunachal Pradesh, and Whereas the tribals can move across that line, I mean, can come, come out and go in again, outsiders, also Indians, are not allowed to cross that line without special permission by, from government. The idea is to avoid what has happened, for instance, in Andhra Pradesh, that so much tribal land falls into the hands of outsiders. That has not happened in uh, the Apatanis, for instance, they uh, <coughs> might have been overrun by people from them because they have quite fertile rice land, etc. If that hadn't happened, if they had not been protected. Also, the Apatanis, when they then, after my first experience with them, when they came in close contact with the Indian administration and with uh, the people of Assam, because Apatanis a, a could go to Assam. When they started to uh, develop, for instance, some trade with the rest of India, with Assam, they were not at once, uh, they didn't have to fight the competition of the ordinary trading cars like elsewhere, Banyas and there were no money lenders in there. So they could really develop in a modern way, but they could develop on their own. And there also, 
the education which was then introduced was very successful, so that very many Apatanis got good education, first in their own area, and then young people, promising young people, were sent to various Indian universities. So you have now large number of Apatani graduates and some in civil service and Apatani doctors and veterinary surgeons, etc. Now there's hardly any other area in India where tribals are, have been as successful. And they have been, I think, so successful because during the essential periods of development, they were protected from the competition with more advanced outsiders. So they could also become advanced, being more or less left on their own, but yet given them the, I mean, they were given the possibilities, for instance, for education, for development, etc. Well, thank you very much for uh, explaining that. Um, at this point, you've done a lot of field work in two different areas, which is more than most anthropologists have done. But you then came back uh, from your administrative post here to London to become professor of anthropology. What date was did you become professor at the School of Oriental and African Studies? At what time? Yes. Well, I came back. I was offered a job at the mm. School of Oriental and African Studies in 1949. When then I left, I mean, I resigned from my post in Hyderabad. Uh, I felt that really that was not a period when in India. Uh, non-Indian could effectively work in quite a controversial position. Namely, I mean, to do tribal administration is always controversial because there are always the, uh, the vested interests who try to acquire tribal land, who try to exploit the tribal. So I think an uh, outsider here in the modern, uh, in the present setup in India, can really could not effectively work. Apart from that, I thought also from my anthropolo from the point of view of my anthropological career, that ten years continuously in India, most of the days spent in field work, were about enough, and it was time to go back to a university, also to catch up with everything which has happened for 10 years in uh, anthropological thinking and theory. And so I, uh, that position at the School of Oriental and African Studies seemed very attractive. And I was able, uh, then gradually there in the, in the department, the newly departments, uh, created Department of Anthropology to build up uh, a type of, I mean, interest in the areas in which, which I was interested, and uh, also expand my own field, perhaps. Uh, School of Oriental and African Studies has a great advance that uh, they were very research-oriented and that meant that it was not necessary to wait for a sabbatical. And one could quite often go to the field. And so I was able, very soon after I had established this department then, uh, not only to encourage my students and members of the staff, etc., to spend a good deal of time in field work, but also myself to go. And once, uh, that was in 1953, when I actually had gone back to Andhra Pradesh to see what had happened to the Gones, etc. Then that was just the time when Nepal opened, was opened for outsider. Nepal, which had always sort of interested me because I had worked a bit in the eastern Himalayas among Apatanis, Daflas, etc. But uh, Nepal seemed a wonderful field for anthropology, but it had been closed 
at the time of the Rana rule, and only when the Rana rule came to an end, was it possible for Westerners and Western anthropologists to work there. So, in 1953, you went into an entirely yet another virgin territory, so to speak, um, and spent a shortish time then, and, but revisited it in 1957 and at other times. Where did you go to work in Nepal? Well, I started with the Sherpas of the, uh, at that time, uh, that particular area uh, had become quite uh, famous through the climbing of Mount Everest. <laughs> and also, uh, one had heard about the Sherpas. And I thought now, after being, having been for so long in the tropical areas, I mean, the, of uh, South India, it was a, would be very interesting as a contrast to go to an area of high altitude. Now the Sherpas, they live in valleys of an altitude, the villages of between 12 and 14,000 feet. And also I thought it would be very interesting to uh, start in an area which was under Buddhist influence. I mean, not only, uh, they were actually Buddhists, they were of Tibetan type of Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism. So I expected something totally different. And I think this is very important for anthropologists, not just to stick to one area, of course, of which you can get a complete expertise, admittedly, but the comparison of such people as different, on one hand the Chenchus and the Konyak Nagas and the Apatanis and so on. And then in, in Nepal I found the Sherpas, uh, who were of course compared to people like Gons and so highly civilized people. I mean, among the Sherpas, for instance, certainly more than 50% of the adults, particularly adult men, could read Tibetan because they needed that for their ritual performances in their Gompas, and then there were these interesting Buddhist monasteries. So there was something totally new. And uh, so, although I continued, and even now I usually spend some time of the year in the one or other area of my previous interest in India, um, actually since 53, certainly for about 10 years, I concentrated almost entirely on Nepal. And in the course of that, um, I walked really through the length and breadth of, of Nepal and then found areas which seemed worthwhile of study so that I could encourage students of mine to go to those areas and do a much more detailed study than I had been able. But I did manage not only to uh, do some work on the Sherpas, and uh, write a book on the Sherpas, this, this kind of first book on any monograph on any uh, people in Nepal. What did you do then? Well, actually, almost while I was working among the Redis, I thought I should know something about their neighbors too. And then I did a trip to the, into Orissa, in the hills, all the Eastern Ghats, where there were two tribes which had never been really described at that time. One is called Bondo and the other is Gadabas. The interesting thing is they were quite different from anything I had seen in Hyderabad. And they reminded me in a way of the Konyak Nagas. Uh, linguistically, they also don't really belong to the s South. And they don't speak Dravidian language, but they speak uh, Austroasiatic languages. And these Bondos and Gadabas, they, uh, in some ways, they have cultural similarity, I won't say connections, but certainly similarities to the people in the uh, Northeast, and uh, I found I did not do a, a detailed study there, but they also, for instance, had a very developed megalithic uh, culture, and uh, they had, you mentioned before, the 
use dormitories and uh, similar uh, institutions, perhaps in a way as an argument. So I found that that was only a sort of short interlude, but they were again something quite different from anything I had seen before. And of course, uh, they gave me some comparative material rather than that I made a detailed study of them. I think we can cut it out. So we'll cut here and move back to the... To the Sherpas, yes. Um, could I ask you, before we go look at the Sherpas themselves, I noticed that you dedicated your book on the Sherpas to your wife, Elizabeth. Um, and you mentioned her frequently. You said she ga helped gather s the statistical data and she helped you in the medical work and so on. I wondered if you could say something about her part in your anthropological field work. As soon as uh, we, we got, my wife and I went to India, uh, we were always together in the field, and so um, she naturally took a very considerable interest in it. Indeed, I mean, there was nothing uh, else to, if you are well mad to the anthropologist and you are sitting among, in a little village, you obviously either you go mad or you have to take an interest in the people you are living with. So um, it is very difficult to say really what the, the one or the other uh, contributes. I mean, I did the more sort of uh, professional part of it, uh, but she always was made perhaps partly the public relations uh, work. I mean, she always uh, treated anybody who, I mean, people who were sick or had any problem and distributed medicine and so on. So I think it uh, was a, a, a quite an important uh, cooperation in the field and I think it is I have the feeling that it's probably easier for two people who are not exactly doing the same I think that uh, couples were both were professional anthropologists uh, it is more difficult to work together in the same among the same people while if one is an anthropologist and the other is uh, uh, looks at the people from a different purely sort of human point of view I think that that works very well later on my wife of course then uh, as you may know uh, went into anthropological bibliography and wrote all those uh, bibliographical works on South uh, bibliography of South uh, Asian anthropology. Well, you talk of, uh, since we're talking about field work, can I just ask you, um, many of the areas you went into were extremely remote and um, without any kinds of modern facilities. Um, what did you find the most difficult aspect of field work? You mentioned frequently, particularly among the Apatanis, the lack of privacy, the constant being watched and being surveyed. Even your private, most private ablutions and so on were watched. And you could gauge the age of the watchers by the, the height of the small hills they bore in the wall <laughs> watching from. Was that the most difficult thing about field work? Or? Well, I think the, that is, if you are come to a people like the Apatani, it were very many people living in one area, so it's a, it's a large population, and they had never seen any outsider. And you are surrounded virtually uh, during day, daylight hours by large crowds all the time. I think this is difficult. Uh, one gets used to that too. The other difficulty is, I think, purely, how much shall I say, purely physical hardship. For instance, the tent shoots. These people, they uh, in Hyderabad then, uh, 
hunters and gatherers, so they don't produce anything which is very edible for you. And nevertheless, you have to move with them through the forest. You can't really uh, carry much with you. So uh, there one is, I mean, you and you live there in more or less in the open because they have no houses and uh, well you can have a tent but in the um, Indian summer it's simply the climatic difficulties and so on. I mean everything has its own uh, advantages and disadvantages. I mean Nepal has the enormous advantages that <laughs> the scenery is so beautiful and there are houses to live in etc. On the other hand uh, again while you suffer from the heat in in the Deccan in, in South India the, the cold can be very troublesome too if, if you are traveling and uh, I've just now been about months ago I was back among the Sherpas and we, even in the houses it was very often sub-zero temperatures. <laughs> well we're back in Nepal um, so perhaps I can ask you um, about uh, Nepal, uh, about the Sherpas uh, further. Um, what struck you most about the living among the Sherpas? Were there any features of their society which surprised you most when you were like there? Uh, let us see, if, which didn't surprise me very much because I expected it, but uh, features I had not previously, for instance, encountered. I mean, I had no, definitely no, no personal contact. For instance, one was their marriage system, polyandry. I mean, and I was surprised to see that polyandry, which means one woman has two or three husbands, that, that seemed to work so much better than polygyny. Namely, one man having two or three wives doesn't seem to run as smoothly as one woman having two or three husbands. Now, these are sort of little uh, experiences one has in the sense that uh, you find what you something which you don't expect. Could you, uh, since many people are interested in polyandry and it is a special feature of that area, uh, could you explain why you think A, the system works so well and why it's there at all? Is there any rationale to it? I think it works well. Perhaps that for, perhaps one may say that on the whole it may be that men are a little less jealous than, than women are. Perhaps because, among the Sherpas particularly, these men, they have other interests in the sense they, they uh, move about a great deal. They have to go with the yak up to the high altitude. Somebody has been to in the house, so it's quite useful if your wife is not alone at ha in the house, but your younger brother is there because he's also married to her. That may be one of the reasons. But uh, another is, but I think the in Indian families where there is polygyny, I mean, too, they're very often the women are jealous of each other for the sake of their children. If the son of one wife seems to be favored by the husband, then the other wife gets jealous. Now that does cannot happen in polyandry because nobody knows who the father is of the children. The children are all belong to the brothers, the husband. Usually there are two brothers or husband together. So there is not that extra uh, possibility of becoming jealous because of jealousy over the uh, attention given by the husband to the children. But why, you may ask, how do I know it works better? Quite apart from the observation that you don't seem to be many quarrels, and I've never seen two men quarreling because you sometimes in other in polygynous societies you see wife to wives shouting at each other etc but that in 
the folklore, the legends and tales, etc., of polygamous societies. I mean, there is very often the motive of the jealousy of the wife, the younger wife, or the poisoning the elder wife, the elder wife poisoning the younger wife, etc. Now, I have never not found a single legend or story, fairy tale, of the joint husbands being in conflict. So I thought that that might be uh, a fairly good reason why one might say it works more smoothly. I wondered uh, if you could say something about the economy of the shepherds. Um, when you first went there, what, what was their economic system? Well, the economy of the Sherpas, indeed of other high-altitude people, other Botia groups, whom I then later on uh, studied in s about similar altitudes, the economy is based on one hand on agriculture, although the uh, period of cultivation, of course, is short between May and September, the only time when it is area is not under snow. Uh, so the one part of the economy is agricultural, the other is animal husbandry and mainly the uh, breeding of yak. And the third you, is trade, and tra because in these very high areas without some kind of additional income population really could not survive. So they have to also, apart from breeding yak and growing uh, buckwheat and potatoes, because much more you cannot breed, breed at that altitude, so they also were kind of intermediaries between, on the one hand, the grain-growing areas of Nepal, and on the other hand, Tibet and they were placed favorably near the high passes. So they took the transport of the grain from the lower areas into Tibet, and they brought from Tibet such commodities, salt, mainly salt, and wool, and various other things to Nepal. So they were really both agriculturists and cattle breeders and traders. The difficulties arose, of course, when uh, with the change of government in Tibet and the Chinese occupation of t Tibet, for temporarily these frontiers were closed. And then the Sherpas had to look for other uh, sources of income. And actually, it just happened that tourism developed in Nepal and the Sherpas. Uh, were able to make up for that shortfall by not only working for mountaineering expeditions but also becoming tourist guides. And that has really completely changed their whole, the whole uh, social situation in <coughs> the Sherpa area in Kumbu and their economy. And as I just mentioned, I very recently was in uh, Kumbu and went back to the same Sherpa villages where I had worked in the 1950s and one could hardly recognize the society anymore because now the men who work for t a tourist guide they are only spending about two or perhaps three months a year in their villages the rest of the time they are in other parts of Nepal or in Kathmandu and so that the, uh, certainly the social life is now no longer imbalanced in the villages. There are women and very old people and children, and the able-bodied men are all away from the... It's rather like sort of almost labor migration, perhaps in Africa. So things have changed very much.
Yes, it is similar to quite a lot of those tribal groups there with labor migration to the army. And yes, and for instance, the Gorongs, who have, whom you know so well, and where so many of the men are in the Gorkha regiments of the British Army, of the Indian so Army. Did you visit the Gorong territory? Yes, I did. Indeed, I think I was the first <laughs> anthropologist who did a little trip through the Gorong areas. And uh, then it happened to be, you know the work, of course, of Pinier, whom I met in Kathmandu, and I advised to go to the Gorgs, which he did. It was but I never published anything about Gorgs, but I found them very interesting.